Um, hi. Hi. How are you all? Um, this is a large crowd. Um, hope I don't disappoint, and if I do, there are cookies over there. So uh, feel free to take part. Um, I'm super thrilled to be here. Um, it's nice to just um, roll out of bed and be able to drive less than two hours to a campus talk rather than like getting on a plane. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and you know, always nice to just continue to hang out in the frozen tundra that is the Midwest. So um, you know, hopefully it'll warm up soon, but if not, we'll make do. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, fostering trans inclusivity. Uh, this is a little bit of a different setup for my presentations than I usually do. Um, usually what I do is kind of roll through um, my book and, and things that I kind of looked at and studied with my book um, and these nine fabulous participants that I did work alongside of. Uh, what I decided to do for this talk is actually think about, um, so teeny little backstory. Uh, Yesterday, I just submitted my portfolio for my third year review as a faculty member, right? Yeah. Um, it's off my desk. Um, and so as I was preparing these materials, I was really kind of thinking about um, not just the book, but like the body of research that I and other tra largely trans scholars in education have been doing. And so I wanted to think about how we can use all of that research to think about fostering trans inclusivity rather than just one book of research, right? So I'm gonna try and pull together a lot of different threads and see, see if we can make some connections across research. Um, so that's the goal. Um, now, usually when I do presentations, I say, um, look, it's totally, it's totally okay if you're on your phones. I understand, right? Like, it's never okay in my classroom, right? But uh, feel free to tweet if you'd like to. Uh, feel free to use the hashtag trans in college. Um, I think it's helpful sometimes to share with people who maybe can't be here, right? So people are in classes, people are doing things. Um, but also to create a back channel that we can kind of keep connected on even after the talk. So feel free to use the hashtag and tweet. Um, I also want to start um, by giving some thanks. So um, first of all, thank you to Carrie for reaching out and doing all this fantastic coordination um, to, to help get me up here. Thank you for all the co-sponsors who were named. Um, it's really nice to, you know, sometimes when, um, and I think other faculty members in the room probably know this, right, like um, we write all these things and then we hope that people beyond just our moms will read them. Right? Uh, my mom is like, tell everyone that your book is really good. I'm like, okay, mom. <laughs> so, my mom says the book is good. Um, but you know, it's, it's always really nice to be able to kind of come and talk about uh, the work that, that we're doing as academics. And it's especially nice to be able to come and talk about the work that we as trans academics in the field of higher education have been doing together. So. Um, that's particularly exciting. Um, I also want to make sure to uh, talk about the fact and, and kind of call into the room um, the fact that I am not alone in doing this work, right? So I stand on the shoulders of giants in doing this work, particularly trans women of color who have continued to put their bodies on the line for me to exist the way that I exist and to be able to do the work that I do, right? Um, and so uh, it's, it's particularly important to recognize that work. Um, these are folks who um, often do not do their work in educational spaces because educa educational spaces have always been foreclosed to them. Right? They're activists, they're artists. Right? Many of them have passed away far too soon um, and some of them are still really active. Um, and so I just want to kind of call that legacy to the fore as we start today. Um, I also want to recognize that we're on occupied territory, right? so this is not right, my land. Um, and, and certainly um, Wisconsin-Madison right, is on occupied land, particularly uh, the land of the tribes of the Winnebago, the Miami, the Sauk, and the Mesopotamia. I think this is particularly important, um, not in a kitsch kind of way, but in a way to kind of think about the fact that all of our liberations are intertwined together. And the ways in which the gender binary exists in this country is thanks to, right, and when I say thanks, I mean that sarcastically in the Northeast kind of way, that I guess, <laughs> but is thanks to the ongoing project of colonization. Right? So when we think about trans liberation, we also need to be thinking about decolonization. We also need to be thinking about 
contending with racism and anti-black racism, especially in this country. And so I will talk about trans liberation, but these projects are always already intertwined, and we can think from right, a multi-dimensional framework where we where we kind of recognize and honor interlocking systems of oppression. Okay. Oh, is I don't know. Is it can people hear me in the back? Okay. I don't know if I need to turn it up or something. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, I can use my big girl voice. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Got a joke. All right. Yes. Got a joke. All right. Yes. Here's, here's my friends. Uh, thank you. You're my friends. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what do we know about trans people, right? Um, how does what we know relate to prior knowledge across identities and experiences? What ought we to do with all of this knowledge? And then um, we'll leave some time for questions. Questions plural. We won't just take one question. I don't know why there's not. <laughs> um, one question, lots of comments, and all the compliments you have. Um, so we'll we'll have lots of time to be able to do that. Okay. I guess. All right. So uh, this is the only definition that I'm going to give you for this talk. Uh, if you have other questions, please feel free to let me know, and we can keep on right, chatting as we go. Um, I often sometimes uh, fear that trans presentations can devolve into me becoming a glossary, right? And that's not why I'm here. I'm here to talk about research and how we can use research. This really should be a starting definition, and I'll share with you other resources that you can use, but I always go back to Susan Stryker's text, Transgender History, right? If you haven't read this text, please do. Um, there's a lovely glossary in it. And she <laughs> refers to transgender, um, when she uses that phrase, she refers to people who move away from the gender that they were assigned at birth, people who cross over, uh, trans, um, <laughs> the boundaries constructed by their culture to define and contain gender. And so, uh, briefly, right, what trans is, is an identity or an experience and a way of being in the world. It's a way that we as trans people relate to our world and other people, right? What it's not is merely a performance or something that we put on and then take off at night, right? Um, and, and it's not a spectacle, right? So this is for us as trans people, not for other folks who aren't trans, right? And so that hopefully will kind of clear up any kind of definitional questions that people have. Again, if you have questions, I'm happy to, to talk to you some of that stuff, okay? Um, so briefly what I want to do is I want to talk about um, what I'm now turning a transplosion of research yes. <laughs> in, uh, in higher education, right? So that's my particular discipline is, is higher education and student affairs. Um, Stephen Whittle, um, about 12 years ago, in the first edition of the Transgender Studies Reader, wrote in the introduction that um, that trans um, that the notions of being transgender, right? Is, is actually one of the most, was, he argued, one of the most talked about things um, that you can go on any kind of website, do any kind of internet search and get loads of hits, right, around trans issues, trans topics, trans people, um, that there were whole academic disciplines that were popping up, right, so we now have the Trans Studies Program at the University of Arizona, right, that exists, um, and that, that there was so much social visibility, right, there was increase in social visibility, and this is in 2006. Now, we can certainly talk about um, how that increase in social visibility has also very uncomfortably been situated with an increase in harm and threat, particularly of trans people of color. Um, so, you know, social visibility is not always the best thing. Um, but here's the paradox that, that has happened, right? What I'm calling kind of a trans paradox is that while we were getting so much more increasing visibility and awareness of trans people and trans lives, there was nada in higher education. Right? Much of the work before I and some of my colleagues came in and started doing research was really focused on non-empirical studies, right? so studies without actual people, without actual empirical data, and, um, and was also deficit-minded. Right? So how is it that trans people aren't doing as well as their cisgender peers, right? As if that's a dichotomy, right? Um, and so uh, what we have been able to do, right, over the last number of years is to be able to um, 
fill some of those gaps that have been, and, and really chasms, right, that, that have been kind of existing. We've been able to start to resist and push back against this trans paradox where there's lots of social visibility, perhaps, but not much visibility through education, right, and not much especially through higher education. And so um, we kind of, I can kind of like throw research into a couple of different buckets, right? So one is kind of cultural manifestations of trans oppression, right? So I take as a given, right, because I'm a critical theorist, because I use critical paradigms, right, which for folks that may not know, um, focus on the fact that oppression is a real everyday facet of our lives. It's not an aberration, right? Um, I, and, and I do cultural ethnographic work, so I think about cultural discourses that operate across college campuses, right? We can take as a given what I call these twin cultural realities of gender, right? So in, in the book that um, I've written, I talk about gender binary discourse, so how the gender binary is literally a discourse that pervades all of campus, right? Um, folks in education might be familiar with notions of the hidden curriculum, right? So it's not always things that are said, although it can be, but it's also a hidden curriculum of policies, practices, attitudes, and behaviors, right? That regulate, quote unquote, appropriate gender across our campuses, including in classrooms, as well as everyone who's writing a dissertation in this room, right? Be aware. If you want to set yourself apart, make up a new funky term. Yeah. Right? Find yourself a neologism. And, and that's, that's what compulsory heterogenderism is, right? Like, I, I defended my dissertation successfully because of that term. Uh, uh, so compulsory heterogenderism is the way that um, there was this cultural discourse on this particular campus that I did my research at that has, has popped up on other campuses and socially as well, um, where people's trans identities were erased and replaced with stereotypical notions of sexuality. So Jackson, one of the participants that I worked with, would say things like, well, I oftentimes don't identify as, as agender because no one really knows what that means. I just tell people I'm a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And it's Jackson having to respond to this unknowability, the illegibility of being agender and capitulating to this kind of social norm of, oh, well, this is what a lesbian quote unquote looks like. So, Transness is so unknown, is so unintelligible, right, that it gets replaced with stereotypical notions of sexuality, right? So these are twin cultural realities on college campuses. Um, we can also say, if folks are familiar with um, Laura Jane Grace, trans woman who's the lead singer for Against Me, um, she actually, and I didn't pay her to do this, um, she actually sings about compulsory heterogenderism in one of her songs. Right? She talks about, she doesn't use that term, wouldn't that be cool? But um, she talks about this phenomenon in one of her songs. Right? And so when I was rewriting my dissertation into the book, I was actually able to cite her work by saying, here's a social manifestation of compulsory heterogenderism. Right? Um, we also talk about connections and disconnections across race, gender expression, disability, and sexuality. So in my book, I talk about how a lot of participants' narratives cohere or come together or arrive at singular points, right, around particular phenomena. There are also departures in ways that their experiences change based on race, gender, expression, gender identity, disability, and various other identities, right? So um, because there's one, not one monolithic understanding of who we are as trans people, I wanted to be able to capture a lot of those disconnections, those ways that data actually depart from each other. So those are particularly important. We can talk more about those as, as we go along. Um, so for example, right, there are some particular ways that black and non-binary college students understand notions of passing, of realness, right, being a real trans person or quote unquote trans enough, right, as well as this notion of trans normativity. What does it mean to show up as trans, right, and be legible as trans on a college campus? Um, there's also, um, and this should come as no surprise to anyone in this room, that there's a lack of intersectional praxis on college campuses, right? We often talk about co-sponsoring events or thinking about multiple identities without really thinking about how we build curricula across identities and experiences in deep and meaningful ways, right? How we think about macro systems of interlocking oppression, right? So we get these one-hour programs where like Janet Mock is brought to campus and it's co-sponsored from the Queer Center and the Black Cultural Center. But beyond that, 
the queer center remains white, right, which data shows right nationally as a thing, and the black cultural center remains rather straight and cis, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of happening on this particular college campus. And then there's this trans enough discourse with which my colleague Chase talks about often, right? This idea about like trans normativity and how there's intra-group dynamics within trans communities around this. What does it mean to be quote unquote trans enough as well as discourses that are placed on us by cisgender people on, on campuses as well. Oh, you're not real unless, right? You visibly transgress gender or you take <coughs> testosterone or estrogen or whatever. Um, so again, this is not to shame trans people, right, this trans enough discourse. This is a way that, right, like, internalized oppression actually manifests, right, this is the way that systemic oppression manifests. We also see specific sites of trans oppression. So we've done work thinking about LGBT centers and the inclusion or, in large respects, exclusion, right, of trans people through LGBT centers. Thinking about programming about trans people rather than programming for trans people. Wouldn't it be nice if there was more programming for us rather than using us as objects of curiosity, right? Um, we also see this tension in relation to naming and hiring practices. So the T is usually kind of thrown on there. It's an LGBT center, but remains a largely cisgender space, right, in terms of hiring practices, programming, all that kind of stuff. We've done some work on trans uh, housing and gender-inclusive housing. Um, I, I can't believe that I have to continue on saying this, but like me and my colleagues Rachel and Susan were oddly the first people in higher education to ask trans students how they were experiencing gender inclusive housing. This has been a quote unquote best practice for years, but no one's really asking them how's it going. Um, so we did a national study. Uh, not well is the answer, right? Um, gender inclusive housing is largely our research found focused on, um, focused and centered on um, cisgender administrators feelings of guilt shame and fear right so how's that for a practice right it's meant to be for trans people and about trans people but it's centered on trans or on cisgender administrators feelings right that's weird and uncomfortable um, i've done some work with um crystal harris on women's centers right how does trans show up in women's centers um this to me also harkens back to um discourses around um women's and gender studies programs as well. So um, this year, it will be 21 years since Wendy Brown wrote her piece, The Impossibility of Women's Studies, which actually still is intensely present right now. Right? So what do we mean? Who are we hailing when we use the word women? Right? And how do we think about this, not just in co-curricular spaces, but through curricular programs as well? Right? We still don't really have a good handle on that, I would argue. Right? Um, some of my colleagues are doing some great work thinking about the experiences of trans educators, right? So largely they're thinking about student affairs educators. Um, I'm also doing some work with a colleague right now, Katie Jekyll, thinking about the experiences of trans and gender nonconforming faculty members, right? Um, so we're, we're seeing, right, more of this research kind of popping up. We're also seeing, like I said, resilience-based and affirmative approaches to research, right? So um, I talk about practices of resilience, I call on, um, Judith Butler's work around practicing, right, this gender as a practice, I think about practices of resilience, um, that focuses on, it, it pushes the responsibility onto to changing toxic environment, environments and climates, right, rather than like, if we aren't resilient as trans people, then it's our fault, right, this notion of grit usually focuses on individuals. Um, here's my little tagline. I think grit is shit, right? <laughs> Say it with me. Grit is shit. Uh, but, but what I'm interested in is like, what are the practices of resilience that we can engage in? How do we think about resilience as a verb rather than a noun, right? And how can we use practices that work for us and trash practices that don't and try different things to be able to navigate our campuses, right? So more of an affirmative base for thinking about that. Um, I also think about trans kinship networks, right? So quite literally on college campuses, we can think about particular sites and locations that students would often identify as queer bubbles on campus. And if we map those out, right, they create this kind of network. These networks go off campus, right? I think about Cade's book club, trans and queer book club that he organized at City University. They can also be online, right? So when I started this research, I was like, clearly all these trans students are gonna be reading lots of books and learning about themselves through books, because that's what I did, right? I'm old, right? <laughs> and 
all these folks that I were talking to were like, no, I went on Google and I Googled gender and transgender and then I found Tumblr and then I like never left. <laughs> so there are like these virtual kinship networks that are created that are super meaningful and important, right? And thinking about our own gender as well as connecting with people across genders, right? And then we can think about some emerging threads um, and threads that need to emerge, right? So um, we need more work around sexual, uh, gender expansive sexual violence prevention. Um, so some colleagues and I are, are doing some work on that. Um, we do need more, more work on trans faculty. Um, Dr. Eric Pitcher out at um, Oregon State is doing some good work. There is a book that's going to be dropping at some point very soon um, with his research. Um, we need more research on trans women, trans feminine, and non-binary collegians. Um, I just read a piece that was published in the journal of LGBT Youth about non-binary collegians, and so um, Wisconsin is a great library. I'm sure you have access to that. Um, but Kate Kuvalanka and Abby Goldberg just wrote a really important piece about that. Um, we need to think across educational contexts. Um, one, of the, one of the critiques of my book, um, and I think it's an appropriate and necessary critique, is it focuses on four-year institutions. Uh, we need more work focusing on two-year colleges, nonprofit colleges, um, uh, certification programs, right? Because we know that two-year colleges especially are much more pluralistic than four-year institutions, right? So actually trans people might be gravitating towards those institutions more. Knock on wood, hopefully the, fe uh, the Spencer Fellowship application that I sent out will get funded and then I can do some of this research, right, with two-year two -year folks. Um, and we need more work around trans-centered knowledge production and methodologies, right? There's been some work that we've been doing thinking about trans epistemologies, trans research methodologies, um, but we need more of this, um, particularly as we think about, and this is going to be particularly important when we think about um, curriculum building, right? So academic programs and curricula. How is it that we center trans knowledge and trans knowledge production, right, as something that is robust and important when we're thinking expansively about gender, right? So it's not gazing at trans people, but it's thinking about particular trans knowledge and how that is important in shaping the rest of the way that we, we think about gender, right? That's a lot of transplosioning to be doing over the last three or four years, okay? Um, and so here's the too long didn't read. Um, so uh, we do have, right, this nice explosion of research, um, and it, it really parallels um, what, I'm, what I'm seeing around four ongoing discourses throughout higher education. And so I was looking at kind of this broad set of research. I was thinking about like what else are we knowing about higher education, particularly around inclusion and, and diversity. And there are some connections with um, four different kind of notions or concepts. So the first one is notions of assimilation, right? So um, Dean Spade is writing about this when he thinks about population management in his book Normal Life, which if you haven't read, do. I do not get paid by Duke University Press to say that, but it's an important, important book. Um, my colleagues Amanda Tasheen and Nolan Cabrera and Eliza Yellowbird have often been, have been thinking about this in terms of indigenous populations as well as Sarah Water, or Stephanie Waterman. But transness is often erased and explained away as a more palpable or respectable form of, of sexuality, right? This is the compulsory heterogenderism. We also can think about gender and sexuality continuing to be conflated, like continuing to be conflated. Um, like when, when folks are like, oh, what is it like to be LGBT? I'm like, wow, that's a lot of letters to be, right? And so <laughs> we can just think about teasing these apart a little bit. Um, a lot of people talk about, in, 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 in education especially, they talk about doing quote unquote LGBT research, but there's like not a trans person in their participant pool, so it's not really LGBT research, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's deeply problematic. Um, gender is often transformed to, to code for cisgender woman, right? Oh, we do gender studies work, and we focus primarily on cisgender women through our curriculum, right? That's not really gender work, or it is, but it's maybe like a limited form of gender work, right? Um, Transness is further made to be kind of off limits, right? Because if we should be thinking about gender as the sole and exclusive property of cisgender women, or with burgeoning kind of masculinity studies, quote unquote masculinity studies, we can think about cisgender men too, um, then transness becomes even further off the table, right, in terms of thinking. Um, 
And we can also think about, and here's where identities come together, right? That when we think about trans identities, what we've often done in the past is focus on white, able-bodied, right, trans identities. And so we're not thinking about black transness, non-binary transness, trans femininity, crip trans identities, right? Um, and so there's this reinforcing of respectability politics and assimilation that's, that's happening, right? There's some great folks who are pushing against that, particularly Kai Green is doing some fantastic work around black trans love, right, and black trans cultural wealth. Um, but we need more of that work, right? We need more work by folks like Eli Clare, who are really thinking very deeply about connections and disconnections between disability and gender. Right? Um, also think a lot about uh, Sarah Ahmed's work. So in her book, On Being Included, she talks about this idea of the non-performative. The non-performative is a speech act that actually is used to intentionally not do what it suggests to be doing, right? College campus puts out, puts out a statement after a racist incident, and the president, or whoever writes the statement, says, there's no place for racism at, at Wisconsin-Madison. <coughs> Lie. There obviously is, right? And so this is a non-performative statement. It's actually used to right, detract from the fact that like, Wisconsin-Madison is a place for racism, right? Because America. Right. Um, so, so when we think about non-performance, right, we think about this lip service that's being paid to wanting to quote unquote do better, right? Oh, I really want to do better. I really want to do better. Well, at some point, you need to stop messing up and actually do better, right? <laughs> um, and so that becomes particularly important. Now you understand the killjoy part of my Twitter handle, by the way. <laughs> if you weren't on board already, um, we talk about write policies about consume literature regarding trans lives, narratives, and experiences. But we don't put this talking, these policies, or this literature into action, right? I gotta tell you, like, if things don't occur, right, after you bring in a trans person to talk about trans research, then, gosh, it's just 90 minutes of looking at me with my fabulous makeup and listening to my jokes, which is good, right? But, like, hopefully the idea is that you're here to actually transform campuses, right? We also need to remember that, as Dean Spade very astutely points out, the policies will not save us. We actually, we need to not do the policies, we need to do the doing of the policies, right? That's this performative piece that we need to be engaging with. Can we hold questions until the end? I just end? a definitional question. Oh, sure. What? Yes. Um, Crip trans identities, can you define that? Please? Yes, sure. So I'm thinking about disability studies, right, and this notion of crip or cripping identities. I'm also thinking about, um, Robert Brewer's work around crypt theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thank you for asking that question. Okay. The other two kind of buckets that I'm thinking that align with some of the trans research is um, notions of absorption. Rod Roderick Ferguson writes about this in The Reorder of Things as minority absorption, right? Ways in which um, Radical potential is basically sucked into an organization and made to be moot based on kind of diffusing out that radical potential. So notions of passing realness and transnormativity, right? They're playing out on, across college campuses, which is stripping radical potential from movements for gender liberation. Let's just make sure that this is a quote unquote normal thing, right? Like, let's slip in one trans studies class, special topics class that's taught every three years on a, um, every other Saturday that no one can attend, and therefore, right, the radical potential of gender liberation is being absorbed into a women's studies department, let's say. Um, Neoliberalism, right, is reinforcing separation and individualis uh, individualism over collectivism and coalition building. So this is why we actually have a really hard time doing something beyond co-sponsorship, mm -hmm. because I, as someone who works in an office, need to show that I'm using taxpayer money efficiently and effectively, that I'm getting butts in chairs when I do programs, and that I deserve to be protected as an office, particularly important for a state like Wisconsin, <laughs> right? We can think about academic and co-curricular involvement in that respect. That metrics are held as supreme, especially those that are quote unquote good PR for the institution, right? Regardless of the actual practice on the ground. Um, and that resources are highly maldistributed, right? Um, so we say that we care about diversity, we don't actually fund and staff diversity-related initiatives at all appropriate 
Um, so that's the absorption piece. And then this notion around epistemological oppression, right? Again, it's really important to think about the, the locust for knowledge production, right? Um, so trans oppression, right, mediates how we come to know our environments and those with whom we work and learn. And if we come to know gender, um, if, if how we come to know gender is restricted, then our academic curricula are likely complicit in that constricting of notions of gender, right? Um, and that means that knowledge production and reproduction becomes yet another location for the normalization, right? There's this notion of normalization of population management, right? That Dean Spade talks about um, that I'm picking up on, right? So it's not just actual practices, it's ways that we come to know gender and understand gender, or I would argue misunderstand gender, right? So that's the, the epistemological oppression piece. Okay, take a big deep breath. But that was my pedagogical practice, so I could take a sip of water. It's, um, it's a lot of information, right? a lot, a lot of information. Um, thankfully, I will say, it's a lot of information, right? We can actually now say that we have actual research and actual data for higher education that we should be using, right? And thinking about trans inclusivity, right? But there's a lot of stuff here, right? And so what I want to be able to do is try and break some things down for you and think about what this actually means. Right? I'm not going to give you, I'll be really clear with you, I'm not going to give you a one through five step kind of map of what you can do, but I'm going to ask some questions that I would invite you to think about yourselves, take back with you to your offices, your departments, to talk with your fellow peers and students about, right, as a way to motivate some change. The reason that I'm doing this is not to be intentionally obtuse, is that you folks know the culture of Madison far better than I do, right? And I don't believe in this notion of best practices where you just take what I say as someone who works at Northern Illinois University and who did right, my research at a different institution, right, to, to automatically assume that that will work here. Right? You folks need to help me out with some of the transferability of, of some of this, right? So I'll ask some questions and maybe pose some challenges. Um, so you might be wondering this, girl, what can I do, right? Let me help you out. Okay. Um, so uh, in Dean Spade's Normal Life, um, he writes in one of the late chapters about this idea that comes from the Miami Workers Center of around four pillars of social justice infrastructure, right? So you're not going to get the five steps to trans inclusion guide, but I am going to ask some questions around these four particular pillars, right? Um, when Carrie and I were talking, uh, Carrie had mentioned, hey, it would be great if you could think about some policy implications, right? Well, you can't think about policy impl implications if you don't think about these other three pillars, right? And so what I want to do is kind of talk about all of these four pillars together that can then hopefully help create a solid foundation for trans inclusivity at Madison and beyond. Right. So, pillar of consciousness. Remember I said I was going to share some resources? Y'all, we got research, right? Um, in an age of post-truthism, right? That was the word of the year last year. Um, I find it's really important to go back to the empirical literature and resources, okay? So when we think about higher education, again, my mom says the book is really good. Um, your library has a copy of it, which is checked out right now, but that's good because somebody's learning. Um, Transgender History, Susan Stryker's book. Um, this Gender and Sexual Diversity in U.S. Higher Education is um, a monograph, right? So you can access that through the Madison Library as well. Um, there are two particular TSQ issues that I think are really important. Um, TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, also probably accessible through your library. The first double issue is a big, big glossary, 86 terms. Learn them, love them, use them, right? Um, it's a fantastic um, issue. The other issue on the far end is an issue that I helped co-edit that focuses particularly on education. K through 12 as well, for K through 12 friends in the room, right? There's some good research on K through 12 stuff um, that you can use as well as pedagogical stuff in there too, right? So for people that teach across disciplines, so really interesting pedagogical stuff. Um, and then qualitative studies in education, um, there's a special issue that just came out last year that I um, edited that um, is called um, What's Transgressive About Trans Studies in Education Now? Harkening back to what's queer about queer studies now for all the queer studies folks in the room. Um, 
And then there's the syllabus. So if people are on the Twitter, right, you can find me on Twitter. It's my pinned tweet. Um, it's a publicly available syllabus, much like the, the Pulse syllabus, the Charleston syllabus, the Ferguson syllabus. Um, and I'm always happy to, to update it, too, because I know I'm trans, but I don't know all the trans stuff, right? So please feel free to, to add things that, that I might be missing, right? So that, this is just like a smattering of some work, right, that we can use to increase our consciousness, right? And we can do this on our own rather than requiring, right, other trans people to give us the one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's one of the reasons why I resist doing glossary type of presentations, right? There are glossaries out there that you can use, right? Uh, by the way, the first, the first week in that entire syllabus, right, all places that you can go to for definitions. The pillar of power, right? So if we're thinking about power, right, what I want us to really think about is um, who are, right, um, or, yeah, oh, hold on. Uh, I want you to resist this notion of professionalization, right? Dean Spade talks about this in terms of what, what he terms the nonprofit industrial complex, right? But there's a way in which we in higher education engage in this notion of professionalization. Well, I, as the one with a terminal degree, must know everything. I, as the professional trans person, must know all things trans. I gotta tell you, I really don't, right? And in fact, people who are living their lives on college campuses probably know quite intimately the experience of trans oppression in ways that I don't as a privileged faculty member, right? Um, and so we need to really resist this notion around professionalizations that only people with advanced degrees or tenure track faculty or people with certain titles can do X, right, or know X. So that means how do we invite in people to the conversation? How do we center things and people and experiences that are often decentered or marginalized, right? We need to ask, your, ask ourselves, am I tokenizing or am I investing in liberatory futures? We can invite a trans person to the table, but that doesn't re-alter the way that we think, right? Just having a trans person at the table doesn't mean that we're trans-inclusive or that we're practicing liberatory politics, right? How are we unlearning the way that just inviting someone to the table is actually deeply problematic, right? And just practicing tokenization, right? We need to ask ourselves, what am I willing to give up in the name of justice with and for marginalized people? This is a question that I've started asking people as I've gone around to different campuses. And I think it's particularly important for those of us with privileged identities in the room, right? As a white person, what am I willing to give up? And not to be a savior, right? But what am I willing to give up in the name of decolonization and racial justice and how that attaches to gender liberation, right? Am I willing to give my time? Am I willing to give labor? Am I willing to give money? Am I willing to give up this idea, this fictitious idea that I am an expert because I have a PhD. Right? These are all ways in which we can give things up and we need to give things up in the name of gender justice and gender liberation on college campuses. Right? I often tell my students this, but it's not about y'all. Right? It's not about y'all. So how can we decenter our egos, decenter ourselves, and what are we willing to give up? Um, I also really encourage people to become deep, active listeners and non-leaders, right? How can we be deep supporters? How can we be alongside and with people without feeling the need to lead people, right? This is why trans epistemologies and trans methodologies are so particularly important, right? We talk a lot. When my colleague TJ and I are doing work around trans methodologies, we think a lot about this notion of being with and alongside. How do we partner with, how do we develop community and use that community as right, a liberatory process in developing new knowledges, right? So how can we become active listeners and non-leaders? How can we support without being seen, right? When we think about the pillar of service, all right, who are your classes, offices, and programs serving? I know who you think they're serving, but who are they actually serving, right? Y'all would not like me if I worked on this campus, right? Like, it's good that she's like two hours down the road, you're probably dating. Um, so, uh, 
our research indicates, right, that big body of research indicates that oftentimes <laughs> dominant populations and ideologies are centered even when discussing trans folks. Um, so again, going back to the gender inclusive housing stuff, um, the programs and services are centered on cisgender feelings of guilt, shame, and fear, right? I'm fearful of mythical board of trustees members. I'm fearful of programs shutting down. I'm fearful of losing money. I'm fearful of, right, all these kinds of things. Some, some of them are deeply legitimate fears, right, particularly in a state like Wisconsin. However, there are still ways that we can partner together to meet some of those fears. Those fears need not hold us back from doing the work of justice and liberation, right? Um, I also think that we need to be really discussing um, curricula rooted in binary and or limiting vision, limited visions of gendered subjectivities and futures. Now, this goes beyond, right, like a women's studies program or a gender studies program, right? How is it that, like, when we think about STEM fields, when we think about law, when we think about business, y'all, business, <laughs> right? Um, when we think about BC, one of the participants that you meet if you read the book, um, BC says, um, I was, I'm an econ major. When we first met, she said, I'm an econ major, um, but I'm thinking about dropping, and she ended up dropping her major, um, because on her syllabi, right, it says she needs to do, or to do presentations in these classes, that she needs to dress in quote unquote professional attire, and professional attire is X for men and Y for women. And she said, you know, I thought about like getting some kind of like mashup of, right, like a, a, right, like a feminine top and then like, right, pants that were more masculine and kind of fucking things up, but then like, just gets really exhausting and laborious and expensive. Right? So like, these are the ways, right, that curriculum across our fields and disciplines are invested in binary notions of thinking, right? That when we think about knowledge production, the only knowledges that we're sharing are those knowledges created by any cisgender people. Well, especially when we start talking about trans people, that becomes deeply problematic. Right? There's some good cis folks doing some good work, but also some a lot of cis folks doing really problematic research right, on trans people, not with trans people. We also need to be thinking about services and programs that are about but not for trans people. Right? This is that that labor element that I talk about in, in my book, right, the idea that um, being trans on college campuses oftentimes is very exhausting because we are pigeonholed and created as expert, and we have certain identities that because of neoliberalism, other people want to consume. Come give us the 101, come do a coming out panel, and let me ask you all sorts of really awful questions. And, and really, how can I like think about not you as a person, as a trans person, but parts of your body, right? How are we literally cut apart, right? So that becomes really important to think about, right? How do we create classes for trans people? How do we create programs and services for trans people? How do we center certain people, right? What does it mean to serve with? How does this shift Shift the uh, shift away from right a savior complex and instead recognize our shared liberation. Right? So this is not just about, as I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, just about trans people, but our shared liberation. Right? Okay, and pillar of policy. Okay, last one. Um, so we need to recognize that policies are, as I talk about them, necessary and yet insufficient. Right. So um, Adam, one of the participants that I worked with, talks, talked about non-discrimination policies as caution tape on college campuses. They tell people where not to go, but they don't actually stop people from going there. Right? I can't carry around, nor can Adam, a non-discrimination policy and say, don't make this environment uncomfortable for me because look here, gender identity and expression are in this policy. Right? So we need to think about the doing of the policy, not just the creating of the policy, which we spend so much time thinking about in higher ed. So many fun committee meetings, y'all, thinking about <laughs> policies, <laughs> words, blah, 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 right? Like, how can we get the word intersectionality in there? Yo, if you're not doing it, right, that's problematic. Um, as well as co-opting the work of women of color, right? That's a different, great conversation. Um, and we also need to think about, um, Right, this idea that we can invest in changes beyond. <laughs> now, okay, here's my caveat. Bathrooms and pronouns are hella important. Mm -hmm. I believe that, right? This is not a conversation about like bathrooms don't matter. 
I also, believe it or not, need to go to the bathroom, right? And use my pronouns as a way of expressing myself in, in, in many ways, like in, in ways that like no one else sees, right? Or doesn't automatically think about, right? When they, when they look at my body. So these things are important. And we need to invest in change beyond bathrooms and pronouns, right? Like we are not just people who use pronouns and people who use restrooms, right? And so while those are important and they're necessary, they're insufficient. And we also need to be thinking beyond non-discrimination policies, right? These are usually like the three buckets that people automatically think of in trans inclusion. Let's, let's get a bathroom. Let's put our pronouns in our signature line on our email. And let's make sure that gender identity and expression are in our non-discrimination policy. Important symbolically and also because we need to relieve ourselves, right? But it doesn't actually change the way that gender operates culturally as a discourse on our college campuses, right? How are we reinvesting and unlearning gender? How are we looking at shaping change across these other uh, across these other pillars to make sure, right, that all of this work together creates a more inclusive, and I would argue maybe more liberatory environment, right? Inclusion is one thing, liberation is a totally different thing. And so we need to be thinking about curricular changes, about programmatic changes, about changes to how we do our work, and changes to how we arrive at decisions. Dean Spade talks about trickle-up activism, the idea of working with those who are the most vulnerable to create change, right? I use that notion and I talk about trickle-up education. How do we work with and alongside those who are the most vulnerable? How do we center the people who are the most vulnerable in the ways that we come to decision making on college campuses, right? Not a practice that we often do, right? And so this becomes, I think, a particular challenge when we try to reimagine liberatory spaces. We also need to be engaging in constant self-reflection about policies and practices. So this goes back to Leanne Bell's work around social justice being a process and a goal. It goes back to Dean Spade's work where he talks about constant self-reflection, that we can create better policies and we can create better practices, but that, is, that does not mean that we've arrived. So how do we keep on revisiting that and continue the conversation? It's great that you have one gender-inclusive building. When are we going to make gender not a thing that we use to place people in residential housing. Because I can think of a lot of better things that are more important to me about finding a roommate, right? Um, just as an example. We need, and we also need to be wary of policy changes that only advocate for recognition or inclusion. So again, inclusion is not transformation. It's just adding different bodies to tables, and those bodies can still be overlooked and dismissed, sometimes in quite violent ways. Um, and that we can't keep on using the same participatory models that have oppressed populations for so long, right? We continue to do this inclusion politics, um, and it continues to oppress people. So maybe we should, like, I don't know, try something different, right? That's the idea of, of trickle-up activism and, and trickle-up education. That's the notion that we can center different types of knowledges, right, and, and really think about those who are most vulnerable and those most vulnerable populations' needs, right? So again, not giving you the five steps, but asking you some questions to really invest in and think about, okay? Um, so, um, so these are the questions that I'll leave you with, right? These are rather existential questions. Philosophy undergrad major, now you get it. <laughs> what are you for? Who are you with? And when will you act? Right? What are you for? Who are you with? When will you act? That's it for me. So, um, oh, you don't have to clap. It's totally fine. <laughs> Stuff a little quick, right? I wanted to make sure that we had some time to process and think about and um, engage in question and answers and compliments. <laughs> um, so if you have thoughts, if you have questions, they can be half baked, that's totally fine. I think we have about 25 30 minutes. I hear they're going to kick us out at 1 30, but let's be rebels and stay until then. <laughs> I've solved all your trans problems. <laughs> yes. I have Hi. a thank you for inviting half baked questions. I feel like my questions are always that way. Um, yes. So I, I'm imagining that maybe the folks in this room are um, kind of like preaching to the choir, right? Like we, you know, I feel like 
you know, I agree with a lot of the things that were said there. When we go out and try to make change, people may not have the same kind of point of view. So if you face adversity of like say, hey, I think that we should make this change to say the curriculum, I'm not a person that really does have the authority to do that. Then we talk about power. Mm -hmm. um, how do you approach that if somebody else who does have more authority um, says, you know, I don't think that's a good idea? Yeah, that's a really good and question. And it's a very vague and half-baked question, so I hope... No, 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 it's actually a really good question, um, and not as half-baked maybe as you think. Thanks. Um, so, uh, I, um, one of the classes I'm teaching this semester is an um, equity and inclusion class for our higher ed uh, program, and we are talking, um, we started talking last week about the notion of tempered radicalism. Um, so some folks might be familiar with this term, some might not be, but it's basically this idea about like how can we leverage small wins and what are some of the things that we can do to promote progressive change in our jobs without necessarily like upending the table and being like, take it or leave it, or I'm quitting, right? Because like <laughs> not, not all of us have the ability to do that, right? Um, Oddly, we're not all like independently wealthy in education. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is really important, right? The the first thing that I would say is, um, again, I think it's most, I think it's really imperative that we let go of this notion of expertise, right? Like, if we waited until we were experts to try and make change, then we would be a hell of a long time to do lots of things, right? Um, I'm not an expert, you're not an expert, we're not all experts, right? And so um, how can we, I often think about like, how can we just ask questions? You know, I'm a question poser. My mom used to tell me that the first word I asked was, or the first word that I uttered was why, and I just never stopped asking. <laughs> I'm sure it's not true, but it's a really cute story. Um, so, you know, like, how can I maybe ask some questions around, like, you know, I've been really thinking about this since this presentation, and I'm wondering, like, why is it that we do certain things the way that we do them, right? Why is it that we have a leadership program that is separated into dichotomous, like a mentorship program for men and a mentorship a mentoring program for women. Quite literally what happens at a lot of college campuses, right? You know, I wonder what the effect of having um, a, um, a, a women in STEM class is. Who's invited to that class and who's maybe excluded based on, like, normative understandings of womanhood? How do we recenter the curriculum there? How do we <coughs> invite new understandings or broadening understandings of women, right? As we see it shaping out in terms of science, right? Technology, engineering, and math, right? How do we use trans knowledges when we think about this field, right? The work of Julia Serrano comes to mind, trans woman who happens to be a biologist, right? Like, we're everywhere, right? So how can we do some of that? Um, how can we think about like, okay, that's really great that we want to put people's pronouns in signature lines, right? How does that maybe um, not do the trick or, or what might we be able to do differently, right? So like because of online environments, we can actually create hyperlinks. How can we hyperlink people's pronouns to be able to say like, oh, if someone wants to learn more, they can click on the link and go to a web page that talks about what pronouns are and why they're important, right? I've seen some people do that, and I think it's really rad. Um, and how can we recognize and honor the fact that sometimes people show up differently in different spaces, and that doesn't mean that they're not real people? I mean, I don't use she, her, and her pronouns all the time, all the places that I go. Because just in case people don't know about this in education, right, like schools of education used to be called normal schools for a reason. <laughs> Highly conservative field still to this day, right? And so I feel a different type of parity in that classroom environment that I might in other spaces. You know. So asking some questions, finding some people who can champion with and alongside of you, really using using off work times, right? Using lunches, using right some of those I don't know if you all have water coolers around here, but like water coolers <laughs> right? Like when the weather when the weather is nicer, take walks with people. Make unconventional partnerships on campus. Right? There are some people who do really great trans research and trans work. There are some great people beyond this campus, right, who do work in the community who can be fantastic resources, right? 
Um, so those are some ways that we can practice tempered radicalism and really be in the gender liberation fight for the long haul, right? Which is particularly important right now with the administrations that we have in both with Wisconsin and in the country, right? It won't change overnight, but we can make we can make steady progress. I think. Does that help? Tempered radicalism. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that, like, I'm starstruck with like, meeting you right now. I Likewise, I'm loving <laughs> 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 um, So, um, I also, I also love your outfit, which is great. Um, so, I am a, uh, I'm a program coordinator at Edgewood College, which is a uh, private Dominican Catholic school about a mile away from here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm the only out trans faculty, not faculty, staff member at the institution that mm -hmm. I know of. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question is, is kind of like along the lines of this lovely person down here. Um, like, what, um, what are ways that you're, that you kind of come back complacency? Because that's kind of like where I'm at, because like coming from, um, like not being from Wisconsin, I have not seen this high level of complacency, sure. especially at like a private Dominican Catholic institution. Mm -hmm. So like what are kind of ways of like combating that complacency? Yes, uh, good question. Um, okay. So the last two summers, um, I've taught this um, gender and higher education course and the story is going somewhere, I swear. Um, <laughs> and whenever I teach the class, um, I have students do a series of journaling activities. The first journaling activity basically says, like, why are you in this classroom, right? Like, what about this class are you interested in? And, and to a T, I guarantee every single cisgender student starts off, or at some point in that first journal entry writes, well, as a cisgender person, I don't really know that much about gender. And I, to a T, always write back to that person and say, actually you do because you have a relationship with your gender, right? It might not be that you're trans, but that's okay because you still have a gender. Even if you're agender, you still have a relationship to your gender, right? It's just not one, right? Um, and so I think when we, when we talk about complacency, I think people might be complacent or apathetic because they just don't think that they have any stake in this, right? Whether they're trans or not. And so if we can start thinking about, and I write about this a little bit in, in the book, if we can start thinking about how um, everyone has a stake in gender liberation, right, um, that that might be a good hook in, right? Now granted, we all have, um, we, all, we all experience consequences around normative notions of gender. Now they're asymmetrical, right? Some people experience different level of violences than other folks, but um, we all are limited by, right, restrictive notions of gender. And so this could be a hook in, right? A way to say like, what's our stake, right? What's your stake in gender? How is it that gender shows up in your daily life? Right, because it literally shows up ever since you wake up to them when you go to bed, and maybe even when you're dreaming, who knows? Um, I'm not sure what y'all's dreams are. Um, <laughs> and so that, right, that can be one way to kind of help people kind of clue into the fact that they actually have genders and that gender is not the express stuff of trans people. Um, then, right, I think we can actually talk about, like, how gender shows up across our campus, right? So how does gender show up in your leadership program? How does it show up in the classroom spaces? How does it show up through um, the ways that you're thinking about orientation programs? Right? And if we can recognize where gender shows up, so quite literally, like, how can we all be ethnographic researchers a little bit and kind of notice where gender shows up? And once we notice it, then we can start asking the question of what do we do about it? Right? So maybe like encourage people to ask good questions, encourage them to take about a week and start to notice and maybe journal down, write, write down where does gender show up in your workspace? Have them ask their colleagues about it. That might be a place to start, right? Just that awareness. Help. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am wondering, as a, a person who is trans and does research in the trans field, your thoughts about the number of cisgender people that are working in trans communities, the tensions, the um, value of that type of uh, yeah. researcher, and how we as trans researchers work with <coughs> cis researchers in this field. Yeah, it's a really good question. I was just talking with, um, as I was driving up, I was just talking with a doctoral candidate, um, a cisgender doctoral candidate whose um, committee I'm on, um, and she was saying, um, 
I'm worried, right? Can we talk about what it means for me to be cis and doing research with and alongside trans people? Um, I gotta tell you, I, um, I think it's really important that cis people start doing research with and alongside trans folks, right? We, we as trans people literally cannot be pigeonholed into being the only folks to do this research. And the caveat to that is, gosh, I really hope that they are investing in unlearning their own right, gender stuff. Um, there are some people who don't. Um, there are some people who have said to me at conferences, right, oh, wow, you do research with trans people. That stuff is so hot right now. And I'm like, yes. that's, that's not why I do that, right? Um, so there are some people who, right, like want to prey on our bodies and our experiences and our narratives um, because they can get publications and they can get tenure and they can get new jobs off of us, right? Um, those are the people that I um, am actively not working with. And also then, like, Right, because we have like the trans phone tree, and we're like, yo, don't work with these people, right? Like, I send out, the, I send, I send out, I send out the sparklers, right? Don't work with these folks. Um, they come, they come in our in our welcome package when we come out as trans. Um, so, uh, trans humor for you. Um, so, so I think that that becomes really important. There's a, a colleague of mine. Um, Kale Edmondson, who is doing some work in um, neuroscience uh, and really thinking about, um, he uh, created this um, blog series for Right Where It Hurts that talks about trans knowledge production, right, and some of the dangers of cis sexism that happens within um, trans knowledge production, and is oftentimes tweeting about all of these medical um, articles that are created that are like, terribly transphobic, right? So be mindful of who you're working with. Um, and also, um, I would encourage you to find ways and spaces to be vocal about um, pitfalls of research as well, right? As much as it's comfortable for us to do. Um, but that being said, I really do hope, and I know that there are some good cis, I have a couple of good cis friends who are doing good cis <laughs> work, right? There are a couple of them out there, right? So like Susan Marine, uh, Rachel Wagner, right? These are some, some folks that I've worked with who are really fantastic in doing Antonio Duran as well in higher education doing some great work himself. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yes. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Good. I'm George. Uh, presentation. Uh, I'm from uh, Madison College, and then we've been doing a lot of exploring on uh, the students. And, and I like it that you talk about more beyond the pronouns and that sort of thing. But right now, and usually talk about uh, creating recommended policies. It's always the topic of data. So we're starting to explore even an application, you know how we ask for male and females, but we don't know our students too well. Can you talk a little bit about how we connect that? Yeah, um, I swear I didn't think this question. <laughs> this is such a good, this is such a good question. Um, and I'm sorry, I've been left at the side of the office. <laughs> <laughs> I know, here for a while. Um, so, data collection. All right, a couple of things about data collection. The first one is this, right? Whenever we want to create some kind of policies around inclusion, right, or diversity, um, there are always people who say, where's the climate data, right? This might, might be a little radical, right? I actually don't think we need more climate data. <laughs> um, I actually think that saying that we need more climate data is a way to kick the can down the road a little bit, right? And basically, um, it, it shows, right, people's fears around changing institutions based on what we know. And what we know is that there's societal trans oppression, right? Just like we don't need more climate data to prove the fact that there's racism across, the like, rampantly across institutions of higher ed, right? Um, I also don't think that we need more climate data to show that there's trans oppression, right? Um, so I, I would say, Right? Then maybe we need to ask some questions around we actually need data to show that what's happening in society, that what we know from data is actually occurring, right? And we know that life doesn't stop at the gates of the campus. So what's happening off campus is leaking onto campus, what's happening on campus is leaking off campus. We actually have large scale national data sets. 
right? Injustice at every turn, right? 2011 report, they just, um, I think, updated their report, right, recently, um, like very recently, right, to talk about societal trans oppression and how that's shaken out for people. Also, too long to read, not very well, right? Um, so we can use stuff like that to say, like, this is happening societally, which means that it must be happening on our campus. If, if we get pushback, and people say, no, 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 we need the numbers. Okay, uh, let's think about how we collect the data, right? Which is really what your question is about, is like specifically how do we ask certain survey items. Um, as a qualitative researcher, right, I will say, have limited exposure, but there are some good quantitative folks that I've been working with who um, will do some work thinking about um, what terms resonate most for campus population. So again, this is about working alongside of trans people and gender non-conforming people. What terms and identities are working for your particular populations? Creating an option, right, where they can choose. So, so there are a couple different questions you can ask. One is choose all of the identifying words that work for you, right, that resonate with your identity. So it allows people to choose multiple because there are multiple different ways that we might identify our transness. You can also ask a question of, of the words that you've chosen, which resonates the most with you, right? You can also have an option where you have like this list, and um, I need to give credit where credit's due. Um, Michael Woodford, who works in the School of Social Work at Wilfrid Laurier, um, talks a lot about this when creating quantitative survey items. He always has this option where it says, um, instead of other, that's um, You can say, um, you can have an option that, that's listed, um, I don't see my identity listed here, period, I identify as both, that someone can write it in. Now then you need to think about how you code that, how you use that data, right? But those are some ways that you can ask, right? So you can have an option where they can pick multiple, an option where they talk about which one resonates most, and then also have that question about I identify as. Yeah, good question. Yes, hi. Um, being a large research facility, some of us are undergraduates who are lucky enough to be working in research labs, but we also find that we may have a very hard time dealing with the people who are in charge of those labs who may not be very helpful, even though we know more of what's going on and we want to make changes. How do we deal with that power imbalance in trying to make changes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Faculty member in ways that faculty will hear you. 
right? Which means using other faculty's research to say, hey, here's this other scholar, here's this other researcher who's done empirical research, and it suggests that we should change in X, Y, and Z ways, right? So you can use me as the head. You've come to this presentation, have a conversation with your supervisor. You know what's really interesting? I went to this presentation and this faculty member, really enunciate that, this faculty member, right, <laughs> said that maybe we should think differently about what we're doing. Can we have a conversation about that? And then it actually might make the fidelity of the data better. <laughs> Let's do that, right? And again, it's not going to happen overnight, but if we continue to have these conversations and you can like sneakily talk to your other friends, right, and be like, you should also say this. <laughs> that, that might be a potential strategy, right? I would also encourage you that if those things don't work, like, there are lots of other labs and lots of other jobs, too, right? And so sometimes leaving is a really important form of activism, right? I think about the expat movement from the 50s and 60s, folks like James Baldwin were like, peace out, America, right? And like, he was hugely influential in thinking about the ways that we combat anti-black racism in the US, right? So those are some potential strategies. So the work that I do on campus is with a couple of committees, student committees, that plan programs for the campus community. So when you talk about planning programs for transplants and not just about them, getting away from this like synthetic coloring. Mm -hmm. What thoughts do you have on how to approach that authentically so that we're not asking trans people to come in and advise us and help bring them into the planning process, but not also assuming that it can assist them as kind of what So the first thing I would invite you to do is think about how you do recruitment for executive boards, right? Like, why is it that trans people aren't joining the organization to help plan the programs in the first place, right? Part of it might be because they don't think of that organization as a comfortable place to be trans. Right? So what are you doing? How are you intentionally reaching out to queer studies folks, to the LGBT center on campus, to various other queer bubbles on campus? And that means that you also need to know what those queer bubbles are, right? So part of it is about self-learning, the other part is about intentional right, practice. Um, I, whenever I think about hiring practices, be it um, in terms of student leadership or in terms of right, like paid hiring staff, faculty, I always revert back to um, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. It's a legal advocacy group in New York City that Dean Spade helped establish. Um, and on all of their job adverts, they have this great phrase at the bottom of the advert that says, um, Everyone is encouraged to, to apply. We specifically invite, right? That's some really great language about inviting right, people with minoritized genders and sexualities to certain positions. So I would encourage you to look at that. Um, and that way, you don't have to worry about tokenizing because you're creating the conditions by which trans and queer students want to be a part of your organization to then change the program. Um, I would also encourage you to say, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with creating trans and gender non-conforming listening sessions. Why is it that you aren't involved? What would you like to see? Now, the way we cannot tokenize is that we can actually pay trans people for their labor. <laughs> and yeah. yes. and, and paying trans people for labor looks a lot of different ways, right? So, like, it looks like gift cards. It also looks like university swag. It also looks like, and like nice shit, not stuff. <laughs> right? Like, like a Madison sweatshirt, right? It also looks like buying a meal that you can talk over, right? There are a lot of different ways that we can think about paying for labor. Um, it also means that maybe you might say, you're a really great person. I have this work study position in my office. If you have work study, have you ever thought about right, working? And then you're doing the good work of student engagement, right, which we know means. And, Helps out retention and persistence. So those might be some strategies that are about that. Yeah. I think we have time maybe for one more question. Anything else? I did it for like 30 minutes to spare. Thank you so much. <laughs>